Should we go ahead and get started? Okay. And lunch is at 12, is that right? So we've got 30 minutes? Okay. Sounds good. Great. <clears throat> so we talked a little bit about plasma primarily and other preventive strategies. Really the purpose of this talk is to talk about the transition. So um, at Zimna or recombinant Adam TS13 was approved at the end of last year. Um, so as many of you are aware, there's a big transition now for those people who want to switch over from plasma, or maybe if you're not on anything, just starting on this medicine. So what I thought I would do is just give you a brief overview of how the drug was tested, what do we know about this medicine in comparison with plasma, and then um, what are sort of some of the barriers? It sounds like several of you have already made this transition, but if you haven't, what are the sorts of things um, that can be challenging and make about making that transition. Um, so again, this is designed just as a dis more so as a discussion than anything else. Um, but I thought I'd try to give you a little bit of information on the background of the medicine. Okay, so these this graph I know is very complicated, but um, what I want you to see is that these were uh, nine people who participated in the phase one study. So phase one is where we're, what we're trying to do is understand the safety of the medicine. We also did measures of Adam TS13. So we can see these are all people who received 40 units per kilogram, which is now the approved dose. So you can see the levels of Adam TS13 at time zero. So immediately after the drug was given, go very high, above 100% sometimes, and then slowly come down over the course of several days. I've given you a line there at five days where the average level of Adam TS13 dropped below 10%. Now, Dr. Scully earlier mentioned that to have a TTP episode, you, um, it seems to be required that the level of Adam TS13 is less than 10%. And we've learned that from the immune form of the disease. So we do use that as kind of an important landmark. We know that in people, have a level less than 10% that they could have a TTP episode. So um, I think what this really tells you is about how long the drug lasts in the body. Now, what you can see is that they used a very fancy way of measuring the Adam TS13. And you can see there is still some available uh, in the body over the course of a few days. I think we don't, what we don't know is how important very low levels of Adam TS13 is. Okay. So now the phase three study. Now this isn't perfect. What I did, I tried to simplify the way the drug was studied. Um, so this is not the exact study design, but I think from a, a practical standpoint, this is essentially what happened to people who participated. Um, and so I apologize if there are people in the room who participated in the study, you may say this isn't exactly what happened, but regardless, this is what's called a crossover design. We often use a crossover design in rare diseases because we don't have enough participants available to randomly assign people to the standard treatment, which is plasma, versus the new treatment. So instead, everybody who goes on the study receives both plasma and the treatment, and we compare uh, the same person against themselves, essentially. So what you can see, is people were randomly assigned to either receive recombinant Adam TS13, now called Adzimna, for six months, a given every two weeks, although that was technically at the discretion of their doctor. So if they're receiving another treatment, say on a once a week treat basis, they could go on this treatment once a week. And then people would either go on their standard of care, which was almost all people were on plasma. So just for simplicity's sake, I left it as plasma. I mentioned there is another treatment called co in the US, uh, has a different name in Europe that some people were on. Okay, so they went on these treatments for six months, and then what they did was they flip-flopped or crossed over. 
So the people who are getting their standard treatment switch to the new treatment. The people who got this treatment switched to standard of care. And then at the end, they all used uh, recombinant Adam TS13 for another six months. I hope that makes sense to everybody. So there are 48 people who were enrolled in randomized. Uh, now, there was another part of the study I'm not going to just talk about for simplicity's sake, but if people were having a TTP episode at the time they enrolled on the study, they could go on to what we call the on-demand part of the study so that they receive treatment every day until the um, episode resolved. Just for simplicity's sake, I've removed that part for this diagram, uh, but this is essentially how the drug was studied. Now, one question you may be asking is, now, why should we give this medicine every two weeks when we know the level drops below 10% after only five days? Um, now, I wasn't part of those conversations, but I think uh, extrapolating from the way we do studies is that essentially what we want to do is compare apples to apples. So you don't want to change more than one thing at the same time. So if we know the standard treatment of plasma for most people is about every two weeks, asking we kind of know that you can't get people to do more than every two weeks, it's a huge burden on them. Um, that's just logistics and to, you know the toxic nature of the treatment. But obviously with plasma, you know it could be better if people could do treatment say every day. It just isn't realistic. So that's where those those treatments came from, it's not necessarily related to the way the drug was studied in the first slide I showed you. Okay, so what did we find? Uh, and Dr. Scully can give us all kinds of information since she was the author of this paper. <laughs> so there were one TTP episode in the people who received plasma and none in the people during while they were receiving Edzimna or recombinant Adam TS13. Now, there are other aspects of the disease as we were talking about before. One of these most common problems we see in, in this disease is low platelets or thrombocytopenia. We can see elevated LDH, which can be a marker of damage to tissues. Increased creatinine, which is our most common marker of injury to the kidneys. Neurologic symptoms, I, and as we talked about, headaches are very common and abdominal pain. So, and as you can see, I didn't show you because it's a little bit difficult to interpret, but overall, primarily with low platelets leading the way, we saw more of these problems in people while they were receiving plasma compared to receiving the new medicine. And the ATP study. Correct, yep. So, what else did we learn about this medicine? Well, I can tell you on average, the treatment time for recombinant Adam TS13 was much shorter. So the infusion time was about five minutes and for plasma often a couple of hours. So from a convenience standpoint, you can see major improvement there. What about, what about how much Adam TS13 we can give? So I mentioned that the standard dose was 40 units per kilogram. When we measured what people received from plasma, it's about 8.9 units per kilogram. So you can see more than four times less treatment. And that's reflected in the peak amount of Adam TS13 we can measure in the blood after we give this medicine. So the peak was about 100%, so essentially completely normal or average. In plasma, it's about 19%. What was that? I believe it was about an hour. Does that sound right, Marie? An hour after infusion? When so the, the peak? when was the peak? Oh, they measured. got it from about half an hour. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. So it immediately mm -hmm. started working. Correct. And then we did a PK study, so it was every few hours, and then the following day, and then the following day. So peak from the PK, and then the hours and day, quite great, and then the intersection, it was quite intense. So we circulated that for Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and what you can see is similar to what I showed you from phase one was that um, 5.2 days was the average time above 10%, whereas with plasma is only about 1.7 days. So 
I think you can see why the FDA approved this medicine in comparison with plasma. It's much more convenient. It lasts a lot longer and there are a lot fewer TTP manifestations. So essentially normalize the platelet count. Now it's hard to say zero episodes versus one episode is better from a TTP episode standpoint. There just weren't really enough episodes to know. Uh, but I think it's reassuring. I think basically, you know, what's important about the disease is that we have a lot less volume. So, um, you know, just a few milliliters of fluid as compared to several bags of plasma. Um, and we can get the Adam TS13 much higher than we can with plasma. Sorry, so go ahead. When you're talking about one episode, too, mm -hmm. volume is saying episodes also vary in severity. Absolutely. Right. And just remember, for the purpose of a study, we have to carefully define what counts as an episode. So my recollection is you had to have your play the count drop below 100 and below 50% of normal, or your normal, whereas a, just a low platelet count was less than 25% change from normal. So these are all arbitrary, you know, 25% and 50% kind of sound like reasonable changes, but you're right. This is a continuum of disease, right? Um, we just have to set these landmarks so we can compare one with the other, but you're, you're absolutely correct. Okay. So making the change. So, uh, I have, uh, uh a bunch of patients in my clinic who've made the change now from plasma to adzimna. And I, what I can say, it's, it's been a real challenge. Um, I, you know, I have a great staff in my clinic who worked super hard to help everyone get transitioned over. What I will say is that for every patient, the transition has been different. We get different stories, different queries from different insurers. Obviously, this is unique to the U.S. But, you know, in talking with my team about how this has gone, you know, we've encountered different barriers over the course of the year. So the drug was approved at the end of 2023. The drug became available shortly thereafter. And during the first six months, one important thing that we ran into was that Medicare had not issued um, what's called a J code. It's a little bit above <laughs> what I usually deal with in the clinic, but from talking with my team, I understand that these J codes are uh, used by healthcare professionals to bill Medicare. So it's a special code. It also sets very specific um, reasons. So indications are sort of the term we use um, that link the diagnosis and uh, the treatment um, and the criteria to make that diagnosis. So do you need a genetic test? Yes or no. Do you need uh, Adam TS 13 level? All these sorts of things. So it took a while. It wasn't until just last month that Medicare created this code. And from my understanding, that's really allowed a much easier transition. We had a lot harder time. We would often hear from insurers that, you know, Medicare hasn't um, weighed in on this medicine. Um, we need to wait at least six months because um, this is done every six months. And so we had some people who transitioned very quickly to the new drug. Other people, we ran into barriers. And so sometimes what happens, insurers will set their own criteria for approval. And, some, and sometimes those people who create those criteria don't really know that much about the disease. Um, I think what's really important is since most insurers follow Medicare uh, sort of guidance, that now that Medicare has kind of weighed in about what their criteria are, it's going to make that transition much easier. So uh, let's see here. Yeah, so I mentioned that at the bottom. So once sort of we have that leader in Medicare set the rules for what's a, you know, when, what, how we can use the medicine, it becomes much easier. Do you, or does the team yeah. have here the HIPAA code that we can get? Do you have the HIPAA code? Medicare code? There is a HIPAA code. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, do you have that? Yeah, and my understanding those terms are sort of interchangeable. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. we're dealing with going from one insurance carrier to another. Sure. So the more information we can give them up front for them to make their decision, the yeah. smoother it's going to go. 
Exactly. And I think, you know, we had some insurance companies that wanted to make their own criteria early on, um, but hopefully now they'll follow the Medicare guidance. So it should be easier. Now the way that, and I didn't put this in the slides um, before we start talking about acute episodes, is that the way the FDA approved this drug is that people should start on the treatment 40 units per kilogram every two weeks, and then that the discretion of their doctor increased to once a week. Now, what you can imagine is, is that that's going to double the price to your insurer. I haven't yet gone down that road yet, but I can imagine we're going to run into pressure from insurance to not do that. <laughs> it is true. So I think it is, you know, there aren't specific criteria other than your doctor says you should go to once a week. My interpretation of these data or is that I don't like the fact that the drug disappears after five days and I'd like my patients to try to go to once a week. But we understand there are going to be barriers. Once a week is, is more of a burden than every two weeks. Um, the way the drug was approved, it's only given by either a nurse in your home, so you can't self-infuse, or you have to go to an infusion center. And I realize those could be barriers to a lot of people. Um, I think starting at every two weeks at least is a huge improvement over plasma, but I do want everyone to understand that I think we're going to learn more over the course of the next couple of years about what the ideal dosing and timing is going to be. And I feel like we're probably going to improve people's lives if we go to more frequent dosing. But I think we ha that has to be weighed against, you know, people's lives and the reality of, of living with this disease. So we'll have to wait and see. Of course. Yeah, it's a great question. So uh, can you overdose on Adam TS-13? Um, so... We don't know in people, I would say, but um, as part of the testing of this drug, um, primates were given much higher doses of this and there weren't any complications. So, yeah, at least doesn't appear that you can overdose, I would say. Dr. Scully, would you have any other? Okay. Yeah, we are testing higher doses of this medicine in immune TTP because antibodies could soak up the drug, so it is being tested on higher doses anyway. Great. Yeah, I think, you know, obviously everyone's disease is different. And so if you have symptoms that you can clearly document that occur even when you're getting every two weeks or every week, you know, and I have talked with other doctors around the country that have increased the frequency to once a week or every, you know, or more frequently than that because the patient's platelets are just not coming back up to normal or they're having other symptoms that make us concerned that they have complications of the disease. I think. Sure. Yeah. Transition from co to to this so that remain that once a week. And then we just came out of an acute episode, and that's why it's the twice for the time. Mm -hmm. I think the reality is that this is the first time that we actually have the ability to increase levels to this degree, right? Our, you know, with plasma transfusions, it's really 10, 20%. Maybe with plasma exchange, we could get it closer to 50%, I'm just guessing. And so I think the reality is we don't know what the best target is. You know, obviously we want it higher than 10%, but maybe it needs to be higher to protect the brain and kidneys long-term. I think these are the kinds of questions we're very interested in trying to understand. Um, but, you know, those are questions you can't answer from a, a small study um, from the beginning. So, you know, it's a huge step forward to have a medicine that has a much smaller volume and much higher Adam TS-13, but it doesn't mean we're just finished, right? We, I think it's just, how do we improve from here? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, trust me, I love seeing those normal platelet counts just as much as you do. So. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Great. 
Excellent. I thought I would just take a quick minute to talk about a treatment of acute episodes. So I mentioned that as part of the study, there were some patient, patients who were treated uh, for acute episodes. This is the way the treatment was given, the same dose as prevention, 40 units per kilogram on day one. Then on day two, a lower dose, 20 units per kilogram, and then 15 units per kilogram until the episode resolves. You know, I think one challenge is that how do we get that first dose of medicine in? So if you get sick with an acute episode and go to your hospital, right now there aren't that many hospitals that have this on their shelf. And so that can be a real challenge trying to figure out how do we deal with this? So I, I am curious, in the people in the room, you know, does your hospital carry this medicine? Is it something that you've talked about with your doctor at all yet? We just had the acute episode, and so one hospital did not carry it, but mm -hmm. we were able to get it fixed in data. Okay, great. Pretty rapidly within three days. Now, we do home infusion with home health care, so we have our supply at home. Sure. So we were able to take that, and the hospital wasn't able to administer it, but Got it. Uh, when we went to the second hospital, they were not, in our nine days, not able to get that. But since we had the data, it was still sending us, we were able to use that in the hospital. Sure. So ours is a different story. If you don't have that in your inventory at home, it, it, hospitals sometimes are difficult. And then they're very, very, because the expense of it, sure. being left with a dose or two at the end. Yeah, how much, uh, so uh, how long do you have so uh, I'm sure other people in the room are familiar with this oftentimes with home infusion. Uh, you receive the medicine a few days before your nurse comes to your house to give you the medicine. How often do you usually have a dose at home for? Or do you have doses all the time? We, we generally have two to four weeks. Well, a month. It was a month, a month worth. Oh, that's of great. Okay. So 3,000 a unit was 12,000. So we get about a week before and then they sure. you order and resend it. That's so great. Generally, we had that saving supply. Sure. Is that the same for others in the room? Do you usually have some at home or? No. Yeah, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Did you give the dose at home or did you go to a hospital to give that dose? Okay. Yeah. And did they give you, did they infuse the dose that you brought it with you and they gave it? Oh, I see. Got it. Are you going through your insurance? Which one has given you the issue? Like, what's the spare dosage? The, well, the first thing is that it's over. Right, right. Insurance is not going to send this. But if you ever get an increase in the data, it kind of jumps in and saves you. You know? Okay. Yeah. The support. I mean, ideally, your insurance should cover it, right? That's what they should do. But the cake will not let you get in a bad situation. Yeah. Thank you, Janet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, um, I'm confused. Not, and this may just be because I, I would believe, but mm -hmm. so my doctor had said that the medicine could only come to the hospital, and you had to have a special kind of infusion center, which Burlington, Vermont has. Uh, mm -hmm. use yeah. that, sure. Or have capabilities of it, and that uh, it cannot, like it cannot come um, to the patient. Sure. So the there are two ways the medicine can be given. One is in an infusion center. Yep. So you would drive to a center where the nurses are trained, and they give you the medicine every two. Weeks. Specialized infusion. It has an H. The, the name I can't. I didn't write. No, I I don't think so. It's just that the nurses have to be trained. I just go to yeah. Oncology to get my infusion. 
Sorry, yeah, most the yeah, most of these are oncology. Right. That, that you know, there are hemophilia treatment centers that often also will have uh, infusion centers because hemophilia is a similar blood disease where we give replacement protein, uh, or it can be given at home, uh, and so through home nursing. So. Mm -hmm. I've had some really bad reactions sure. to um, plasma. So if there's a really bad reaction when that's being given at home or not in, in a trauma one hospital sure. um, and no access, like I drive three hours to get my information. Sure. Three hours there, three hours back. Got it. So if I were to have a reaction in my home, mm -hmm. we have a band-aid station that's called a hospital in our town. <laughs> sure. um, and the nearest hospital that has any hope of saving me is three hours away. Sure. In either direction. Um, so <clears throat> And you have you received this medicine that we're coming? No. Okay. That's why I, that's one of the reasons why I, I'm not willing to take it, is because I don't feel comfortable having a home health care nurse who, in our area, chances are I had him as a student and they got trained as a CNA or whatever. Sure. Um, so I'm not really, you know what I mean? I, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm being funny, but it's very dangerous. Sure. What I would say is, and I think you should do what you feel most comfortable with, number That's one. That's what I'm doing right now. But so I with, like learn about it. yeah, so with, there are some important differences in the, in between plasma and this medicine. So with plasma, it's a biological drug, essentially. Every unit of plasma comes from a different person who may have eaten something different or have other, take other medicines that you could react to. So, <laughs> well, that's great. So, you know, the, re the reality is that you, you could, every plasma has a different risk of reactions yeah this medicine doesn't come from other people when we say recombinant what we're talking about is the gene for adam ts13 was basically put into a mammalian cell that makes this protein that's how we make insulin and other other drugs that come from people and so it's a it's more like a drug than a biologic agent and while there could be minor differences say from vial to vial the likelihood of a reaction if you've never had one would be extremely rare so i don't believe there are any severe uh, allergic reactions these were all yeah these were all yeah So yeah. I've had really bad reactions to plasma too. I've had no issues with this. I've been on it since February. Um, I would think that if you can drive your three hours and get your first dose, or maybe even your first couple doses at a clinic, and as long as you know you're okay, then switch to the home thing. I've had no issues at all. So you get yeah. it at home also? I don't, I don't get it at home. I'm saying for you, so you don't have to drive three hours, do your first couple doses at an infusion center. I like infusion center because I get a break for my kid and it has to be Um So, but I'm saying do the first couple at an infusion center so you're right there, and then as long as you feel less you feel comfortable, then see if you can do it at home. But yeah. I had, but my point is, I have really bad reactions to plasma, um, and I've had no, no issues with this. And yeah. to speak on that, I get mine done at home, and the nurses that are trained with this medicine are so incredible and so cautious, so much so that I waited an extra three weeks to get my first dose, just so Orsini, the pharmacy that was giving the medicine, could get an epipen out to me on the off chance that you got a reaction. But the nurses are so trained and so cautious oh, yeah. to watch you. Yeah, Orsini, the company that gives you the medication. They have contracted nurses that will drive out to you. My nurse drives an hour. So it won't be someone from your town unless they're contracted underneath the company that is giving you that medication. So they can pick their nurses and educate them on exactly how to get it to you, how to shake it up. You will be in good hands. 
and they do travel to you. Like that's their job. They're getting paid to drive to you. So unless on the off chance someone from Takeda contracts out a nurse in your town, I have a strong inkling it will be someone traveling to you versus you traveling to them. Ours has traveled an hour and a half to, to our house in an additional hour and a half down to Corpus. Yeah, so three, so three hours. hours yeah. to, to, yeah, I, I will say that that's what I've encouraged my patients to do too, is do the first infusion or two at an infusion center so we know if you have any sort of reaction, if you're feeling really nervous about it. And then, like I said, there really isn't variation from you know vial to vial. So if the first few doses go fine, I think you can feel confident things will go well at home. But I can understand why people are nervous about getting medicine at home where you don't have the resources of right. a hospital. It's not so much getting it at home, it's more of the quality of the care. Sure. It's so yeah. Javonki, I have a 21, no, no reactions here. So, 21 infusions. Yeah. 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 So, I think worth considering, but you should do what you feel comfortable with. Yeah, and I do think this can, and, and I think w over the course of the year or so, we'll work out these details. But, you know, for our patients, what we've tried to do is convince the hospitals that they're going to be going to to have a dose on hand. For, for this drug and for most, you know, expensive, rare disease drugs, hospitals can have those medicines shipped overnight. So day two and beyond usually isn't an issue. It's day one. So if you can bring your dose from home, some hospitals will infuse your dose from home and sort of do a swap. My experience is that's becoming less and less common. Um, so ideally what we would say is make sure your local hospital has one dose, or maybe even two doses if they'll allow it, um, and then they can get other doses shipped as needed. The shelf life on um, I'm not sure. Do you guys know? It's a long. I know. I think it's over a year. Mm -hmm. Sorry to the hospital. That is the long. It's only going to be longer than a year. Our emergency is Okay. I mean, can we keep it on hand? The yeah, so, so I think one strategy that we have used is to write a separate prescription for emergency use at home. So actually write a separate prescription for a single dose to have at home. Um, we have been successful in getting that for some folks. Um, I was, exactly, just a rescue treatment, exactly. So. It would be to bring to the hospital. Yep. Yeah, we don't want you to treat a TTP episode at home. So bring it in. Let's find out what your plate account is and then we'll treat you. <laughs> yeah. So what I would say is if you're going to move to this medicine, have your doctor first write the prescription for the preventive therapy. Once that's approved, I suspect the barrier to get to that emergency dose is going to be lower. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, great. Three years, yeah. So you can give, they can give this in the hospital when you're having an episode, just because I know some, mm -hmm. I don't know, I guess maybe like a COVID bad, like after you have like too many symptoms or it's been too many days, you have to go to the hospital and there's certain meds you can't get. This is not the same. If I have an issue, maybe you can give it in the hospital. Correct. Yeah. Yep. It's usually just an issue of can we get it fast enough? So that's why I think having a dose at home is great if you can get it. Is there a team that is trying to educate the hospitals on this? Because to be honest, if I took that to the hospital, they would not let me do it. Sure. Yeah. I don't know. I can't speak to Takeda's efforts about getting the drug available across the country. I don't know if anyone back there can or. In San Antonio, the, the local rep worked with the pharmacists from the sure. and that's what the education crosses those lines. Yeah. yeah, I do. You know, obviously, I think this is happening across the country. It just is 
it's an uncommon disease, so it's a, it can be a slow process. Um, yeah, go ahead. You have a question in the back. This kind of goes back to the day-to-day -day symptoms that mm -hmm. people tend to have with CTTP. I've got another sure. daughter who also has it. Yeah. And they've suffered migraine. It really goes back, ocular type of like headaches, pretty much throughout most of their um, you know, teens and into the early twenties, sure. and now that they're in childbirth and years, um, abdominal pain, a lot of abdominal pain. Those of you who've been on the asthma, have you noticed a decrease in those? Because you've been on it quite a bit longer than Destin has. Um, if you had those symptoms ongoing prior to being on it, my hearing are worse, but I think it's because of my C-section and those like the nerve pain. <laughs> Yeah, I think one challenge is trying to can be trying to figure out what symptoms are actively related to the disease and not. And sometimes it's changing the dosing as an experiment to see do the symptoms improve or not can be one way to try to figure that out. Mm -hmm. my, my doctor said that I should never get DEAV. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, it's going to make me clot more. Yeah. So it will probably kill me. I just wanted to, if that is, if you would agree with that, I guess, or just true, I would at least want to bring it to awareness of the other patients. As yeah. As Agreed. You should not get PDAVP. But. So th this medicine is used for von Willebrand disease. So von Willebrand disease, in many ways, is sort of the mirror image of this disease where people have a deficiency of von Willebrand factor as opposed to the big, long, sticky strings. Um, so we use the abbreviation DDAVP or the brand name is Stimate. It's a medicine that releases extra von Willebrand factor into the blood. Uh, so you can imagine that would cause more platelet clumping. Yep, also called Desmopressin or Stimate. Ah, uh, thanks. Used to be called Stimmy. <laughs> so, yeah, but it's, I would, yes, you should not receive that medicine. Yeah, exactly. If you, well, I feel like a lot of places who don't know might be like, you have a little platelet count, you're bleeding, and they might not know you have TTP, and that was my first thought. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, sure. let's give them something to help them clot and fix the bleeding, and then you're like, well, that doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, and you mentioned pregnancy. This drug has not been tested in pregnancy, and I think there are all sorts of challenges with using this medicine during pregnancy as well. So that's sort of an unknown area. My hematologist was very, like, even right after my delivery, when I was in the hospital for two weeks, he was like, you shouldn't avoid pregnancy. <laughs> like, he was very, he's been very supportive the whole time about and very sure. positive on, and he's like, and maybe we'll give your um, infusions more frequently. He's been very positive about me getting pregnant again. And, and yeah. I think it just is an unknown area because we haven't studied it, but yeah. Great. All right, so we do have time for about one more question. If anyone has anything for us, if they want to ask, we'll get out. So the question is, when is lunch? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's right now, which is why we have one more question. Or time for one more question. All right, well, I'll stick around if there are other burning questions. Otherwise, enjoy lunch. Um, Thanks for your attention. Time.